Buonasera, buonasera. So Good evening. My name is Massimo Mazzalai. I am a journalist with the RAI, uh, and I am chief editor in chief of uh, the uh, RAI Trentino News. Uh, and tonight I will moderate uh, our debate on school. Uh, Learning Interrupted is the title of our meeting. We will talk uh, uh, about the measures that have been uh, taken um, for schools uh, and problems that have arisen during the pandemic in terms of, of uh, the closures of schools uh, and the lack uh, of relations among students and between students and teachers. Uh, and so we will address all these issues. Um, we have approximately 50 minutes uh, at our disposal with uh, uh, four speakers uh, who will uh, offer us uh, their um, insight. So without further ado, I would like uh, to introduce the speakers uh, to you. First and foremost, uh, Andrea Gavosto, an economist uh, and director of the Giovanni Agnelli Foundation. He is very knowledgeable about uh, the uh, sco schools in general and also Trentino schools because he was a member of the uh, scientific committee of uh, IPRASE. Then we have uh, um, Laura Zoller, who is uh, the uh, school leader of uh, the Buonarroti Trento Institute, and uh, it is uh, a uh, technical institute, and so she will offer as uh, a uh, front line, so to say, view. And then Elia Bombardelli, a teacher of mathematics and physics who devised new ways to capture the attention of uh, students. And then uh, Katarina Verna, an economist at uh, the Center for the Economics of Education in uh, uh, Munich. She uh, studies uh, the influence uh, of uh, education on economic development as well. So uh, the floor goes first uh, to Andrea Gavosto. I ask you a, a simple question, and I'm sure that the answer is complex. What about uh, the influence of uh, remote education on the achievement of students in Italy? Well, apparently, it is a simple question, but it is very complex indeed. I would like to use a number of slides, uh, if possible. First and foremost, uh, you see here the situation in uh, the world. It has been complex all over the uh, world. And in dark blue, you have um, the countries uh, that are closed uh, longer. And we also have Italy in that group. In addition to that, on, in, in the right, on the right, you see the situation in, uh, um, in, in Italy. And uh, by the way, in Italy, we had uh, primary schools open starting in September, while secondary schools did not reopen. But all, all in all, based on the UNESCO estimates, uh, 37 um, teaching uh, weeks uh, have been lost in Italy starting in March 2020. So Italy actually uh, is uh, the country in, uh, in uh, Europe, perhaps uh, along with Germany, that has lost m the highest number of uh, schools weeks uh, of teaching. And we will see uh, mid-July when we have uh, the Invalsi, Italian Invalsi test uh, outcomes. Uh, we will see then uh, what was the impact of this uh, a terrible year on schooling. And we have uh, a number of indications, though. Here we can uh, distinguish uh, uh, between different things. I will not enter into details, uh, but we had a first uh, phase of total closure. And then in March, in March, and then the schools reopened September 2020. Uh, 20. Then we had uh, openings and closures again until uh, uh, Christmas. Uh, then the schools reopened partially. And then from February to the end of April, um, with differences in the various regions. Uh, uh, of, of Italy, uh, schools were closed uh, again. Uh, so let's have a 
have a look at what in happened in other countries. Uh, I specifically uh, will focus on three analyses uh, before I address the Italian situation. And the snapshot of uh, other countries is important in order to understand what happened in terms of loss of the basic skills and minimum uh, levels of learning that they should achieve them. We also have emotional losses and uh, loss in terms of uh, socialization, and that also deserves our attention. There was a study that was very interesting. Uh, I will not go to, into details, but you will find this slide on the website of the foundation. Here we have a study from uh, the United States, uh, which uh, considered uh, first uh, what happens during the summer breaks uh, or during uh, periods of closures. Uh, there is a loss in terms of knowledge during these breaks. Uh, and based on that, uh, it was uh, seen that, for instance, uh, students can lose as much as 55 percent when compared to the students of the previous year. So uh, the pandemic actually had a huge cost. Uh, half of the skills in mathematics, a bit less in English. And then we had a Dutch uh, uh, study and investigation that was very interesting. In uh, the Netherlands, uh, they made an assessment before and after the lockdown periods. Uh, and uh, by the way, the Netherlands have a very advanced uh, schooling system. The study was very detailed, and it revealed that, as a matter of fact, Dutch uh, students lost approximately 20% of their skills when compared to what they were supposed to achieve during a normal school year. And 20% is a lot. Uh, out of five years is one year. So uh, this is, of course, a concern. And it is, it is especially concerning for uh, students uh, with uh, a social disadvantaged background uh, where the loss was even higher. Then we have a UK study on uh, children, on school pupils, and uh, here we have the distribution, which tests, which tells uh, that basically tests uh, for children in uh, the second school year of primary school were tragic. Uh, the red line was the previous years, and the blue line was this year of closure. So international evidence tells us that loss in terms of skills uh, um, is approximately 20 percent, two months uh, for two months of schools lost. Uh, again, I will not enter into details, but this is uh, the World Bank estimates uh, that tell us what this happens in ter means, sorry, in terms of economic impact. And data is, again, uh, tragic, I would say, uh, because, uh, of course, uh, the uh, rate, normally the yield rate uh, for education is very high, and all economists do know that. So that entails uh, that uh, this generation student will earn 2,000 euro less in terms of future income, future jobs. If we bring that back uh, to the situation of the next 45 years, if you multiply that by 6.5 million students, means a minus 20 percent GDP. Oftentimes, we focus on uh, the economic loss of the pandemic, but possibly we forget that the highest cost for our country is the fact that students uh, will know less uh, or risk to know less due to the pandemic. This will have consequences for them and also for the economic development of the overall country. Indeed, uh, uh, remote education and teaching partially um, offset this. Uh, we will know to what extent that happened soon. We will start reasoning about that mid-July. We also have data uh, based on a very recent Bank of Italy investigation telling us that uh, remote education in Italy uh, achieved 
different outcomes so that there are groups, especially disadvantaged groups uh, of students uh, that suffered a lot. And the way of having uh, schooling through remote teaching and learning uh, devices, despite the huge effort made by teachers in this case, did not produce excellent results. Uh, it was not conducive to uh, a, a a good outcome. Uh, so remote education means that you should have shorter classes, 20 minutes and then a break, and you should organize things differently. Of course, the uh, front uh, traditional in-person teaching uh, is something that cannot be simply translated into something that you do remotely. We will know in a couple of months from now what uh, uh, the closures meant, but I would say that at least uh, there has been a loss of two months and that means significant losses also in economic terms. We will have to remedy to that in the next future. Now I would like to um, uh, give the floor to Laura Zoller, who is a school leader. So uh, what about your experience and uh, how do you think the pandemic influenced uh, the situation? What about the impact on the achievement of your students? Uh, well, it is a very complex question. What, you, what you're asking. Certainly what uh, uh, Mr. Gavosto said uh, is uh, uh, a clear and additional evidence uh, of the fact that we will have a very long-term impact of this situation. And indeed, the hypothesis is made that we will have major losses due to the lockdown and school closures. Undoubtedly, the pandemic caused uh, uh, and uh, generated a sort of earthquake uh, in the school system. Uh, the school system was upset uh, by the COVID pandemic, and uh, we have uh, to come to terms uh, with the idea that we will have uh, uh, major losses and collapses, I would even say, in this sector, that we will have now and also later on. And yet there is one aspect that we should underline, which I believe is absolutely positive, uh, which is the following. Due to this experience, a number of rigid uh, structures in terms of models of schooling from the past have been shaken and have been taken down. And I really hope that we all will start from, from this and uh, rebuild the system in a different way. For sure, there are elements uh, that, due to this collapse, uh, opened up new scenarios. And I really hope that we are going to be able to grasp opportunities that I'm sure will mean that uh, uh, schools uh, will be really changed uh, for the first time, uh, at least uh, uh, since the uh, Second World War. We need to underline the fact that schools uh, reacted differently in different areas. So there was no homogeneous reaction, and that uh, due to the different technological development of the schools, of uh, the households, uh, and also over various regions. And this is also something that we'll need uh, to take into account. So we will certainly have uh, to be more inclusive uh, and uh, uh, equitable. And there are also some uh, uh, positive uh, aspects, uh, uh, certainly um, the role of technology uh, has had an impact, also the uh, training of teachers uh, has had a role, and also the um, technological uh, level of the schools uh, has had an impact. Uh, uh, so the first impact, of course, was unexpected, absolutely unexpected. But there were schools uh, which were ready, let's say, uh, to uh, react. Uh, 
there has been ex an extraordinary work made by digital uh, facilitators uh, uh, and uh, uh, new ways of uh, uh, doing uh, uh, learning activities uh, um, have been implemented. Uh, uh, so new ways, uh, new methods uh, uh, aimed at uh, uh, making uh, a school uh, tracks uh, more uh, flexible. Of course, uh, there have been uh, difficulties. Uh, um, students uh, have not all been able to uh, react. and. Uh, with reference to that, uh, investments have been made uh, right uh, starting from uh, last uh, summer. Uh, investments for uh, uh, students uh, with special needs, as we call them. And uh, so there have been some positive ele elements in this uh, emergency situation. For example, networks have been uh, reinforced. Uh, for example, our movement, uh, uh, Vanguard, Educational Vanguard, uh, that is the name. Uh, we already belong to that movement, and we have strengthened our role there. So new unexpected resources uh, have been activated. Webinars uh, have been organized uh, to support uh, teachers, but also school leaders, uh, uh, because it was not easy uh, either for us as uh, school leaders uh, to uh, direct the school towards this digital transition, technological transition. So it's not been easy. And we should not forget uh, all the aspects uh, which have to do with the organization uh, of the school, also the uh, issue related to uh, accounting and uh, administration, because uh, there has been a, a transformation of the school which was uh, uh, unimaginable up to last year. So. In terms of uh, results, uh, we don't have uh, data yet. Uh, we will see the imbalance results in a few months. And the uh, results uh, of the final exams, well, we are uh, analyzing them. Mm. And uh, that will be an important uh, evidence as compared to two years ago, because last year data are not uh, comparable with those of the previous years, uh, uh, because we applied uh, uh, assessment uh, modalities uh, which are unusual. And then uh, last year, uh, we uh, had a softer uh, uh, evaluation of students, uh, if you want, uh, uh, while this year we are defining new uh, lines. Uh, um, well, uh, rather than uh, about uh, the loss in terms of uh, knowledge, uh, I would be more concerned about uh, the loss of uh, relations, of social relations, emotional relations, uh, which really make a difference. Uh, uh, and uh, have an impact also on learning. Uh, uh, and uh, if we are able to relaunch uh, this new school uh, model, well, I'm sure that uh, in a little time, and I do not want to uh, contradict what you said, but uh, I would not be so much concerned. If we can uh, relaunch uh, uh, our uh, students, uh, and direct them uh, towards a better self-confidence, uh, I'm sure that uh, we will have good results. So you are cautiously optimistic. Uh, Professor Bombardelli, you are famous uh, because of your innovative uh, methodologies in distance uh, learning. You are a YouTuber, as they say. So how come that you had this idea? Sorry if I making this question. So why have you had this idea of using uh, these uh, uh, non-classical methods? Uh, well, I started to make uh, videos on YouTube uh, in 2012, uh, uh, so uh, a long time ago. 
and I had no idea that uh, we would come to such a situation. Well, when I was at university, more than 10 years ago, 15 years ago, also at the time, uh, some universities abroad uh, uh, uploaded uh, media, uh, multimedia uh, contents. Uh, and uh, so when I went to work uh, to, uh, as a teacher, as a high school teacher, I wanted to see if there were maths uh, videos uh, for uh, students. Um, I saw that there were many resources, uh, uh, but not uh, videos. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to make videos uh, uh, to offer to my students uh, containing uh, uh, information that I normally also share in school, in the classroom. And, uh, during the pandemics, sometimes I had a traditional uh, lesson and then I used uh, some uh, multimedia content in order to recap the most important things. And then other times uh, I show the video to my students and so they uh, had, uh, so to say, an idea of the most important things. And, uh, and then uh, we did uh, problem solving, uh, group uh, teamwork, etc. I share what uh, Dr. Davosto said. Uh, my experience of distance learning is that uh, uh, these uh, uh, lessons, uh, uh, online lessons, uh, work very badly, above all if there are many hours uh, uh, one after the other. In Trentino, we've been lucky with the colors of the pandemics, uh, with the stringencies of the lockdowns, and uh, we were able to uh, do lessons uh, in the classroom physically half of the time, uh, and then uh, uh, during uh, uh, distance uh, learning, the synchronous method uh, has been very useful. Uh, I invited students uh, to watch videos and then I gave them uh, some exercises that they had to uh, make. And then uh, at the end of the lesson, we discussed about what they did, uh, we discussed about doubts uh, and problems, uh, and it worked pretty well. And I did uh, uh, something similar also at the Bocconi University. We used uh, multimedia contents, uh, and I introduced uh, videos, uh, not so much devoted to explanation, uh, and these uh, uh, were videos uh, which uh, could be uh, seen also uh, in the afternoon, for example, but we used the uh, online uh, lessons uh, to discuss uh, about uh, uh, problems, uh, also social problems, emotional problems. Uh, so in general, I think that we passed uh, from a pre-pandemic situation where uh, the uh, digital uh, side uh, was not very present uh, in schools. But then uh, with the pandemics, uh, we moved on to the opposite situation with too much digital uh, methodologies. I hope that, that in the future we will have a balanced uh, situation, more digital, but at the same time, uh, more physical presence. Uh, and we hope we will be able to use uh, the digital technology as a support uh, of what uh, we will do at school uh, in the classroom. So a sort of a blended uh, uh, methodology. And I would like to conclude uh, with a positive uh, note. Uh, well, the data that you showed uh, uh, are a source of concern, of course. Uh, we hope that the situation is better than the worst uh, uh, outlooks. Uh, as a teacher and as teachers, I think that we made uh, uh, the most uh, in order to um, um, do uh, the best uh, that we could do, and I hope that every I'm sure that every teacher did his best and her best uh, to uh, focus uh, on the most important uh, things, uh, uh, focusing on what was really important, and then also focusing on the uh, social side, uh, the sociability side uh, of students. Thank you, Katarina Werner. You mainly focused on the consequences of the pandemics uh, in Germany. What happened there in Germany? What have been the consequences uh, 
of the uh, lockdown uh, stringencies applied uh, to schools? Uh? Yes, exactly. So similar to Italy, I think in Germany, we have a situation where we don't actually have good data on the knowledge the students have. Um, but what we have been able to do in a study is that we have been able to survey parents and basically ask them about the experience that their family and their child had in the period of the school closures in lockdown. And um, it's quite interesting and very much in line with the data that we've already seen that what happened in the period of school closures is we had a dramatic reduction in the interaction that students had with their teachers. So of course, these are just the numbers that parents report, but in the first lockdown in Germany, we saw that only 6% of parents said that their child would have daily kind of online lectures, lessons with the whole classroom and their teacher, um, which is of course much different situation compared to the normal kind of classroom experience. And we have seen that over time this has increased uh, to 26%. So we have seen that schools in Germany have tried really, really hard to increase the interaction between teachers and students, but we are still at a level that is very much kind of reduced kind of interaction between students and teachers compared to the pre-lockdown phase. And what we can kind of wanted to focus on in our study is basically the experience that students had in this time of school closures. And one of the things that we noticed is if we look at students that were kind of prior to the school closures, kind of falling behind on grades a little bit so that were kind of below the median school grade in their classroom, we see that those students were in particularly struggling to kind of cope with the material if they had to kind of study independently. So what we see is that a lot of students, and I mean, of course, there are very good examples where maybe a teacher's tried really hard to create interactive formats, but for the majority of students, what learning looked like in the period of school closures, at least in the German context, was that teachers would send exercise sheets and materials, and the students would be required to basically acquire, read the material, maybe watch some videos, and then basically translate this new knowledge into exercise. And we see that these students kind of, that were already kind of behind on the material a little bit before the school closures were those that were in particularly struggling to kind of cope with this new kind of learning format. And we do see that parents report that students got better, so we do see an increase in the share of parents that think that this, their children are good at independently working towards new material, but we see large differences where some students are just having a much harder time in the period of school closures than others. And in general, if we look at the data, we actually ask parents whether they think that their children learned more or less at home compared to school if they study in an hour. And we see that for the majority of kids, the parents think that the students learned less at, at home, that learning at school would usually be more effective than learning in the home environment. And again, this is in particular true for kind of students that were kind of struggling and low achieving prior to the school closures. But we also have a share of students that actually were able to learn very effectively at home and that actually had large learning increases. And so I think one of the challenges that we'll have when students return to the classroom is actually that we'll have this huge disparity of how much individual students were able to learn in the period of school closures. And basically that will create huge challenges for then teachers uh, once students return to make sure that everybody still kind of get everybody back on the same page in a way. So, Mr. Gavosto, we uh, listened to uh, the analysis that raises concerns, of course. What can we do is the question to solve these problems to uh, move forward, so to say. Well, the three speakers have already highlighted what can be done, and Katharina Werner especially focused on the fact that different groups of students need a differentiated um, approach, because indeed the effect of the pandemic was highly uh, different um, on a student basis. What can we do? Well, I would say that we should try and uh, regain ground. We know that 
what we're talking about has been a general phenomenon, meaning that uh, almost all students endured a loss in terms of emotional skills uh, and also skills uh, which are more linked to, to subject uh, and cognitive learning. We should try and start uh, procedures and approaches so that we can make up for that loss. Uh, it was said uh, that it was possible to do something during the summer. I, I always need to, to, to uh, draw your attention onto the fact uh, that in Trentino, schools uh, are absolutely excellent. So when I go to other regions uh, and say in Trentino people do like that, uh, they react and say, well, of course, uh, uh, that is Trentino, though, and the rest of Italy is something else. Uh, so Trentino is uh, considered uh, a, a heaven uh, and uh, now, we have also understood why. But anyway, the situation is much worse in many other areas of Italy. Uh, what I was saying is that we have uh, to try and uh, recoup what has been lost. And that entails, first and foremost, uh, uh, the uh, social relations. Um, and uh, I would also add that at least at the level of primary school that uh, was hit the hardest uh, uh, and the same goes for the lower secondary school, there we should have a full-time schooling. That would help us uh, uh, make up for uh, the delay that was accumulated. That, I think, is what needs to be done. So increase the number of hours in school. Uh, Laura Zoller, we heard uh, that uh, from you that you are optimistic about the future of schools and students. Uh, well, I would like to say that I absolutely agree. I would like to open schools. I would like to keep uh, schools open 24 hours uh, a day not uh, in terms of having traditional classes, but giving the opportunity to students to be there and do different things. So I would say that the school plans that are about to be approved uh, go in this direction, and uh, they can indeed uh, entail very interesting opportunities. These are extra uh, out-of-school activities by out of school, I mean activities that are not strictly related to the various subjects uh, or courses, but which, of course, are done within the school. So this would help uh, restore the soft skills, which are essential, but also uh, this would absolutely increase as um, Mr. Bombardelli and Mrs. Werner said, um, that would increase the motivation of students, so that students are motivated to actively engage in learning. We should not simply say uh, and pay lip service to the statement that we put students at the center. We should really do that. If we manage to transform schools in this direction uh, by opening up to areas as well, to the community, meaning companies, research centers, and universities, and I talk about the upper secondary schools, uh, we will achieve a lot. But that can also apply to primary school. Of course, uh, it is a different level of learning and socialization that we talk about, but I, I think that that is the way that could really make the difference. Uh, it took a pandemic to uh, draw everybody's attention onto schools. Well, at least uh, that can be seen in, po in a positive way. This is the opportunity to restart uh, from scratch, and uh, the plan for education that was assigned uh, by the minister in Italy together with the social partners in recent times uh, goes in this direction. And we are happy if people consider Trentino as uh, a place which can lead the way in a way and which can serve as a sort of laboratory uh, in this respect. Because you see, this is, I believe, really something that would help us do more and 
This could also act as an incentive and stimulus for other areas uh, which are lagging behind and which have uh, more problems uh, in this moment. I would also like uh, to uh, recall the fact that the dropout school leaving uh, le- rates uh, in uh, Trentino are much lower than in the rest of Italy, and uh, they are even better than uh, the EU 2020 target. Of course, we do have issues uh, here in Trentino as well, but I think that since our situation is better than the general situation, we should exploit that advantage and do even better. Mr. Bombardelli. The schools uh, suffered a number of injuries, so to say, uh, scars will remain. But as far as I understood, we can also say that we will have positive things to bring into the future. What about the positivity? What is positive? I always look for uh, the positive aspects. Of course, there have been criticalities. Of course, we will have to make up for lost ground. And yet, I would say that uh, the step forward made in terms of exploiting technologies uh, is huge. And uh, that is a positive thing. I would say that that has to be uh, become a normal uh, approach. In uh, the working uh, sector, technologies are already present. And by the way, uh, students and pupils know how to use their smartphones. So before, uh, that was something that remained outside schools. Now it is part of schooling. And I think that that is positive, And I hope that it remains so. I think also of uh, the education platforms that have been set up and that have been proven to be very useful. I hope that they remain. And then families, households really appreciate the fact, for instance, that they could have uh, uh, meetings with the teachers online so that uh, uh, parents do not need to take a leave uh, to, to come for, to, to have an interview with the teacher for, for, for five, ten minutes only. So uh, that is a, is a possibility. Plus, meetings can also benefit from uh, remote uh, meeting opportunities. This is something that can remain digital in the future, I think. And then going back to what uh, Laura Zoller said, uh, I also hope that we can uh, further investigate what we tell uh, because the skill, uh, skills mismatch is increasing. And I'm referring to uh, the market and what the labor market demands and what schools do and offer. So let's start to introduce something that fills that gap which, of course, has economic consequences. I believe that that is important, that is essential, and I hope that it happens so that we can start working on things that at present are not part of schools, but we should be. Financial uh, education, for instance, is one of the things uh, that uh, we miss at school. Uh, They uh, read uh, students about uh, um, cyber financial tools uh, uh, on the internet, but they do not uh, have uh, knowledge about cyber currency, uh, crypto currencies uh, from schools. We we could do better there. Um, Katharina Werner, we always have this picture of Germany, of a country which is efficient and open to technology. Based on your studies and observations, uh, is it so that students and families in Germany reacted uh, Um, positively or negatively to the fact that they had to use this new technology uh, to to attend uh, schools. So, So what was their reactions? Absolutely. So even though Germany has kind of a lot of knowledge, a high level of skills overall, actually in terms of the digital competencies, we started this pandemic pretty ill prepared. So if you look at international studies, then actually the overall German population is kind of less fluent in di- digital technologies than a lot of other countries would be. And this is true for our teaching force as well as for parents, for example. Um, but it's definitely the case, which is something that we also see in our data, is that there has been a lot of progress 
and a lot of students have actually increased their digital technology, their digital skills now in the pandemic, given that they had to. So uh, we also seen large increases in digital infrastructure and basically people kind of upgrading technology wherever possible in order to basically enable them to still participate in schooling the best they can during the period of school closures. So I think what we've seen in Germany is basically a lot of people putting a lot of effort into catching up in terms of the digital competencies, but starting at a reasonably low level. And maybe uh, just quickly wanted to say, I'm really uh, glad to hear the optimism um, of Mr. Bombardelli, that we can actually use this increase in the digital skills that we've now had. We've basically had this kickstart where people had to develop all of these new formats. And I really hope that going forward, we can be very mindful and very careful about what aspects of this we will keep and actually also kind of how we evaluate what actually does work in the, in the realm of digital technology. Because I think there's a lot of opportunity, but also there's um, a lot of formats that might not actually give us really good results. And I think it'll be really important going f forward to determine kind of what actually is beneficial in, in the future as well. And what we also looked at in our study, and which I think is also important kind of regarding your question, um, what we see in Germany is that we have had some kind of attempts of programs that have started to try and fill up the learning gaps that, that students saw. And so we've had kind of programs that have been taking place in vacation times or kind of like in addition to normal classroom learning. And what we see is that basically this is very much driven by parents. So what we kind of observe is that parents with good education backgrounds, with higher incomes, are the ones that have been most able to actually organize other learning opportunities for their children kind of while the schools were closed or while kind of learning did not take place in the schools. And I think this is something that we should also be very mindful of going forward. And I think the idea of keeping schools open as a kind of space of opportunity uh, that Mrs. Sola mentioned is important. Um, because otherwise, if we kind of don't have a strong kind of coordinated answer to this question on how students are going to get this extra support, then we will kind of be in a situation where it's very much parents' responsibility to try and basically make up for this lost learning, and that could lead to large differences in how different families basically have the opportunities or are able to give opportunities uh, to their children. And if I'm allowed a final point, I think um, this is something that Mr. Gavosto already raised, and I think it's important to keep in mind. In the German debate, sometimes I have heard people say, well, we can just basically, everybody has been affected the same. We just basically reduce the standards a little bit. We make the exams a little easier. Everybody will go through school, and then we'll all be fine. We'll pretend it never happened. And I would just like to caution against that kind of approach, because what we know from the literature as education economists is that it really is the skills. It's actually knowing how to solve a certain type of math kind of question. It's really understanding what a probability is that's actually going to help you kind of solve problems later on in the labor market. And basically just giving people certificates is not actually the problem that we face, but it's the loss in skills and in actual knowledge that, that students have acquired. So I think that's important going forward in kind of designing our policies. We should keep these kind of aspects in mind. Abbiamo ancora we still have uh, five minutes. I'd like to make a final question, Mrs. Katarina Werner. Um, so, uh, in your opinion, uh, in terms of uh, possible funds uh, and incentives, uh, how should we invest uh, in the school? Uh, what do we really need, uh, well, in Germany, what do you really need? Uh, so what measures do you need in order to improve the school? So I think, actually, in the German context in particular, a large barrier to improvement has been bureaucracy. So we have kind of, there's been a lot of money that has been earmarked for the education system, but basically getting that money to kind of the programs that would benefit from it has been a real struggle. And I think this is a pity, and it should we should have more smooth processes of getting funds allocated to programs in schools. And now if you ask me what kind of programs should be the ones that should be kind of funded in particular, I think the, the important focus that we need to have right now would be kind of training the teaching force to make sure that they are kind of have the best kind of tools at their disposal to provide the best type of lessons that we can have, ideally maybe in a blended format going forward. Um, and then also programs that focus on supporting those students that might be able to get less kind of support 
uh, from home. I think those would be the two types of programs that would be most important going forward. Grazie, Bombardelli. Mrs. Bombardelli. Uh, technological infrastructure. So, Mr. Bombardelli, sorry. Uh, well, first of all, we need uh, uh, technological infrastructure and then uh, training uh, for teachers. And uh, Mrs. Dollar will uh, certainly agree with me. So, to help uh, teachers uh, uh, train and improve their training. Uh, and also, there is also a question of the, uh, which is related to the uh, career of uh, teachers, uh, and then to generate uh, more opportunities for students, uh, giving them the possibility, for example, of going abroad or uh, establishing contact uh, between schools and companies, uh, uh, so the business world. Laura Zoller, how can we spend the money in the best possible way? Well, we should uh, invest. Uh, I agree with uh, the previous speakers, training uh, of teachers, uh, infrastructure, investment uh, in the technological and scientific side, because there is a continuous innovation, and then to invest uh, in uh, teachers' uh, careers, uh, enhancement uh, of uh, their job, uh, and also uh, a new organization uh, for schools uh, with involvement of mid-managers, uh, as we say, in order to change uh, the model of schools. Uh, and then uh, we should not forget uh, that uh, we also need uh, uh, facilities, uh, new facilities, competitive facilities. Uh, so in such an environment where it is uh, pleasant to go to school, well, I'm sure that our students uh, will not lag behind. Uh, Mr. Gavosco, so investing in schools is like uh, putting money in banks. Well, it's more than that. Investing in education is the best uh, possible investment uh, that our country could uh, make uh, for future generations. And in our recovery plan, uh, there is about uh, 20 billion uh, euros uh, uh, invested, at least on paper, uh, with uh, the following priorities, uh, so um, schools, uh, physical schools, uh, and then uh, uh, we should not forget that the average age of our schools uh, uh, is uh, 50 years, uh, so most of our schools uh, go back to, date back to the 70s, uh, so we need uh, um, to uh, rethink uh, our schools uh, uh, based on new approaches. And then training, initial training above all of teachers uh, because there is a huge uh, problem here. Uh, we invest uh, too little in uh, uh, training of teachers. Our teachers are very good uh, in terms of knowledge uh, of their subject matter, but then, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there is no training on how to teach, uh, and this is something we should invest uh, on. And then I share what has been uh, said. Uh, uh, there should be also uh, some reforms, uh, for example, uh, reforms about uh, uh, the recruitment of teachers, uh, which should be less bureaucratic and sometimes uh, also less unfair. So to speak about the future of a school, of the school means to speak about the future of a nation. Now, we have completed uh, our roundtable dedicated to interrupted uh, education. I would like to thank all the people who uh, joined us uh, online. I also thank the physical audience. It's very beautiful to see people here. Thank you, and uh, have a nice evening.